main course for today is vector line integrals. And as usual, before we do some examples, I'm going to go over some generalities. The first, and perhaps most important of which, is how to evaluate these things. So, given one of these vector line integrals, what are we doing? Like with the scalar case, we have a curve, this time equipped with an orientation. All that means is that there's a particular direction that we're traveling on the curve. In the scalar case, the direction didn't matter, but here it matters a lot. The next difference is that the thing that we're integrating isn't a scalar valued function, it's a vector field. Hence the name vector line integral. And it should be said, a vector line integral is just a specific kind of scalar line integral. Remember that the way this thing is defined is that it's the scalar line integral of the vector field dot the unit tangent vector in the c direction. But in any case, I think it's useful to think about this as kind of a new object. So what do we do? Fortunately, the steps are very similar to the scalar case. First, you need to parameterize the curve C. As before, you need a correct formula, but you also need a correct parameter domain. The only difference here is that in the vector case, the orientation really matters. In other words, the direction of your parameterization has to match the direction of the oriented curve. So in the scalar case, you could pick your favorite parameterization, move on, and be done with it. Here you'll have to make sure that you're traveling in the correct direction. After that, we compute the differential dr. And in this vector case, we want dr to be a vector. So we'll take r prime, but we don't have to take the magnitude. dr is just going to be the vector r prime of t dt. And then from there, just like in the scalar case, we can convert this into a single variable integral. The bounds come from the parameter domain. You plug the parameterization into the vector field, and then take the dot product with dr. As before, it looks a little scary, but this is just a single variable integral that you can integrate with no problem. Next, I just want to briefly talk about what these things mean. In particular, what are we measuring when we compute one of these things? The punchline in words is that the vector line integral of a vector field along a curve roughly measures how much the vector field is flowing with the curve. Let me draw some pictures to explain what I mean by that. So suppose we have a curve in red and then that curve is sitting in a vector field F in blue. I'm going to draw three copies of the curve because I want to give you three different examples of vector fields. In the first scenario, I'm going to make the vector field flow with the curve. In the second scenario, I'm going to make the vector field flow against the curve. And in the third scenario, I'll make it flow through the curve. Finally, in purple, I'm going to draw in the tangent vectors to C. Because the curve is traveling to the northeast, the tangent vector is going to be pointing in that direction. So here's the point. When we compute the line integral, what are we doing? We're comparing the blue vectors of the vector field with the purple vectors that are tangent to the curve. Specifically, we're comparing them with the dot product. And the dot product measures how similar two vectors are. More precisely, it roughly detects the angle between the two vectors. So the upshot is that in this first scenario, all of these dot products are going to be positive, probably. So when we add them up, when we integrate, we would expect the line integral to be positive. In the second scenario, all of the dot products are going to be negative because the vector field is moving in the opposite direction as the curve. So the line integral we would expect to be negative. And then finally in the third scenario, the vector field is perpendicular-ish to the tangent vectors, which means we would expect the line integral to be pretty close to zero. And this is how I think about vector line integrals. 
As we'll see, there are various physical interpretations here, like work or flux, or other physics words that I don't really understand. But from a vague mathematical perspective, we're just measuring how much the vector field flows with the curve. Okay, we'll start off with a straightforward example, then we'll turn it up a notch for example two. But in this one, we have a curve C, and it's the oriented line segment from the point 1, 1, 1 to the point 2, 3, 4. Then we have a vector field F, it's X plus Y, Z, and 1. And surprise, the goal of the problem is to compute the vector line integral of this vector field along this curve. Now a picture in this problem won't be particularly insightful, but I'm going to draw one anyway. We've got three-dimensional space. Then we've got this point 1, 1, 1. We've got this point 2, 3, 4. And then the curve that we care about is the segment connecting them. And here, the direction matters. We specifically want to travel from the red point to the blue point. So let's trust the process that I described earlier and we'll start off by parameterizing the curve. So then I think, how do I parameterize a line segment? Well, I need a direction vector and I need a point. And because we want to travel from the red point to the blue point, I'm very specifically gonna pick a direction vector which is traveling in that direction. So I would let V be the blue point minus the red point. This would give me the vector one, two, three, and that'll be my direction vector. Likewise, since I wanna start at the red point, that's what I'll use as my initial point vector. Then my parameterization is P plus TV, which is gonna be one, 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 plus T times one, two, three, which if I squish all this together, I get one plus T, one plus two T, one plus three T. And as always, I need to specify a parameter domain by construction, I'm at the red point when t is zero. This happens because that's what I picked as my point vector. Also by construction, it takes me till time one to get to the blue point. We can just check when t equals one, you'll get two, three, four. So there are my bounds for t, and we have our parameterization. Next, we can compute the differential. DR in this case is just R prime of T DT. Unfortunately, it looks like I forgot to write the prime. So I'll do some amazing editing and add it in right now. And R prime in this case is just going to be the vector one, two, three. That was our direction vector. So there's DR and then we're ready to plug this in and turn it into a single variable integral. Our bounds go from zero to one. This comes from our parameterization domain. Then we have f of r of t dot dr, which is r prime of t dt. And at least I'm consistent with my mistake. I forgot to write the prime again. And so what do we get? Well, f is x plus y comma z comma one. The parameterization is one plus t 1 plus 2t, 1 plus 3t. So the first component of this vector field is going to be x plus y, which is 1 plus t plus 1 plus 2t. The second component is going to be z, which is 1 plus 3t. And then the third component is going to be 1, which, when you plug in r of t, is still 1. Dot r prime is 1, 2, 3. And then we can take a dot product. Simplify the expression. And finish it off. Okay, you know we're in for a fun time when it takes about half the screen to just write out the problem. This time we've got a particle moving from the point 0, 1, 1 to the point 2, 0, 2 in the first octant along the intersection of two surfaces. 
x squared plus y squared equals 1, and y plus z equals 2. We'll let c denote the path that this particle takes, and I'm giving us a vector field f, x, y, z. And the problem wants us to write, but don't evaluate, the vector line integral of f along this curve as a single variable integral. Okay, so there's a lot going on here, so let's pause and think about what we have for a second. The way that this curve is defined is pretty convoluted. We're given a bunch of words about the direction, and then it's described as the intersection between two surfaces. So before I get overwhelmed trying to figure out how to parameterize this thing, let's just break it down piece by piece, and we'll try to draw some pictures to see if we can figure out what's going on. Unlike in the previous example, I think a picture is extremely important here, mostly because of how crucial the orientation is. You could probably figure this out without a picture, but I think having a good picture will help you identify the correct direction the curve travels in. So here's three-dimensional space. The problem says that we only care about things happening in the first octant, so that's what I'll draw. And we know that partially this curve is defined by the intersection of two surfaces. So let me sketch those surfaces. In blue, x squared plus y squared equals 1. In the xy plane, that's the unit circle. And so as a surface, it just extends vertically forever and we get a cylinder. In the first octant, this is what we would see. The next surface is y plus z equals 2. That's a plane. Because it only involves y and z, I could think about this in the yz plane as a line and then extend it in the x direction. So as such a line, the z-intercept would be 2, and the y-intercept would also be 2. It would look like this, and then it would extend forever in the x direction. Thus, the curve is going to look something like this. It's where these two surfaces intersect. Now, what we have to figure out is which direction we're traveling in. This is where the first sentence is important. We know we're moving from the point 0, 1, 1 to the point 1, 0, 2. That means that our starting x value is 0. In other words, we need to start on the yz plane, and then our finishing point has a y-coordinate of 0. That means that we finish on the xz plane. And, ah, okay, so looking at our picture, that makes a lot of sense. That means that this point is probably 0, 1, 1, and this point is probably 1, 0, 2. And furthermore, it means that we're traveling in this direction. Okay, so we have a picture of our curve, and what we need to do now is figure out how to parameterize it correctly. A good way to approach this is to start with one of the equations, for example, x squared plus y squared equals 1, and think about determining x and y just using this equation. In other words, if I project the curve onto the xy plane, we would get the portion of the unit circle that we were talking about earlier. So what I'll do first is I'll just figure out how to parameterize this thing, and then we'll worry about z later. Now, this part of the curve is a circle. I've parameterized a lot of circles in my day, and I know that the usual way we do that is with something like cosine of t and sine of t. The problem is, that standard parameterization is counterclockwise. And after drawing this picture and projecting, I can see that the direction I actually want to travel in is clockwise. Now there are many ways to fix this, so if you want to do something else, that's okay. As long as you get a curve traveling in the correct direction, you're fine. What I would do is I would think, well, I want my starting point to be at 0, 1, and I want the finishing point to be at 1, 0. In other words, I want to swap the finishing and starting points of the standard parameterization from 0 to pi over 2. So what if I call x sine of t and y cosine of t? Then when t is 0, we're at the point 0, 1, and when t is pi over 2, we're at the point 1, 0. Okay, cool, that checks out, and that's what I want to have happen. So from that logic, we've picked x and y, but this is a curve in three dimensions, so we need to determine the z-coordinate. But the second surface is going to determine this for us. We know that y plus z has to be equal to 2. 
In other words, z has to be 2 minus y. We don't have a choice. And since we called y cosine of t, that means z has to be 2 minus cosine of t. And there we go. We have a parameterization of the curve. r of t is sine of t, cosine of t, 2 minus cosine of t. And our parameter domain is 0 to pi over 2. This traces out the correct segment of curve, and it does so in the correct direction. And I'll reiterate, this is not the only way to do this. This is just how I would approach it. And with that, the hard part's over. We just have to set this up and turn it into an integral. So what do we do next? We need dr. That'll be r prime of t dt. This time I remembered to write the prime. And so the derivative here would give me cosine, negative sine, and sine. And with that, we can transform the integral. I'll remind you that the vector field that we care about is x, y, z. So the vector line integral is going to become the integral from 0 to pi over 2. That came from our parameter bounds of f of r of t dot r prime of t dt, as usual. f of r of t is going to be x, y, z. And r of t is sine, cosine, 2 minus cosine. So f of r of t is the vector sine of t, cosine of t, 2 minus cosine of t. Dot r prime, we computed that above. And after we do this dot product and simplify a little bit, for example, some of these terms cancel out, we're done. We've successfully turned this into a regular single variable integral. And it's not even that hard to do. It's very straightforward. But we don't have to do it. So that means we are done.